them and go, whoa, praise God, I need to give my life to Christ. Let your light so shine before men that they hear your really long sermon. <laughs> Let your light so shine before men and put out a big sign out in front of your church with a statement like, if you think it's hot here, wait till you get to hell. <laughs> <laughs> that they may glorify your Father in heaven. <laughs> Let your light shine before men that they may see your good. Glorious. They may see your good. Glorious. And glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. How do we turn on the light to a world that's blind? through the good things that we as the body of Christ, we as Christians, we as believers do. Now I'm going to talk just for a second, take a little side note, little footnote if you're taking notes. We're going to talk about this word good works because it's very misunderstood in the St. Louis culture. Here's what I found. Everybody is growing up in church. Everybody belongs to a church, although they don't attend. I have found that everybody in St. Louis, 2.5 million people in the Metroplex, every one of them are going to heaven. <laughs> Have you found that out? <laughs> By their own admission. Yeah. I can't find anybody going to hell in St. Louis. I, every time I walk up to somebody, I'm like, hey, you going to heaven? Yeah! And they can have vomit on their shirt from the party the night before, a bag of weed in their back, because I'm a good person. Well, what makes you a good person? Well, I do good works. I do good things. Well, what good things? And they have collected their list of the four good things they've done in their life. And they have it. And they can tell you about it. Well, what does God say about our good works and our good works ability to get us to a place called heaven? Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves... It is the gift of God, not of works. Not of works. Least anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're saved by one work, and it's a work you never did. It's a work I never did. It's the work Jesus did when he hung on a cross. Jesus took your sin, he took my sin, and he was judged and punished for us. And he rose from the dead. There's one work by which we're saved, and it's trusting in what Jesus did when he said it's finished. Period. There's nothing you can do beyond the finished work of the cross for salvation and to get your way to heaven. We aren't saved by our works. We're saved by his. But we aren't saved by works but according to this passage, we are saved for good works. We aren't saved by our good works, but he did save us for good works. That through trusting in his completed work, he now says, I've saved you to do good works. Here's the thing. There's no good work that you do that can save you, but your good works can save others. Why are we saved for good works? Because it's our good works that open the eyes of the blind to see a living Jesus. The reality of who Christ is. It's the goodness of God that brings people to repentance. And how do they see his goodness? They see his goodness through his body called Christians. You're saved for good works. The word workmanship is where we get our word from the Greek word. We get our English word poem. You know what God said? You're his poem. You're his masterpiece. The word created in the Greek is the word where we get the idea of something being patented, trademarked, one of a kind. So here's what God said. He said, you're my masterpiece. And you're so good that I liked you so much. I trademarked you, patented you, broke the mold. There'll never be another you. Because God created you special for works that only you can do. Because there'll never be another you. And there are things that God has prepared even before you were born that you should walk in them. What are all these good works? As you just walk throughout your day, as you just live your life, as you go to school, as you go to work, as you're in your community, as you're at the soccer team yelling at your kid, or the coach, 
As you're going through your day, you will find opportunities for these good works that God has already prepared for you. And it's through these good works, when you obey the prompting of God and trust Him, that you're going to find blind people see. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about four blind people that Jesus actually healed and opened their eyes. There's four men that were healed of blindness by Jesus, recorded in the Gospels. What's interesting is all four of them were healed differently. I like that about God. You can't put God in a box on how he's going to meet your needs. You can't put God in a box when you see God meet somebody's need one way to say, God, meet my need that way because God's not going to because all four of these were healed differently. But all four and how they were healed is a parallel of how we, through our kindness, help a blind world see Jesus. So let's jump into our first blind man. And this is blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus is sitting on the side of the road and he hears that Jesus is coming by and he begins to shout out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd goes, Shh, hey, calm down. You're getting a little too loud. You're getting a little too obnoxious. And the Bible says that he yelled all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have you often found loud, obnoxious, irritating people in your life? It seemed to be an interruption in your journey. I love Jesus. Here's Jesus. He's on a journey. He's going somewhere. He's a man with a plan, a man on purpose. And here's an interruption, loud and obnoxious, yelling. What does Jesus do? Hey, shut up. Hey. Go to counseling. <laughs> he stops. And he engages with this loud irritation. This loud interruption in his day. And Jesus asks the most obvious question. So Jesus said to blind Bartimaeus, it's obvious he's blind. What do you want me to do for you? Now that seems almost like an insult. Really, Jesus? I can't see. Hello? So my sight would be really nice. Why does Jesus ask? Here's why. Jesus knows your need. Jesus knew your need before you had a need. Jesus knew your need before you knew you had a need. But Jesus will never move on your need until you invite him. Why? Because God is a perfect gentleman. God will never move further in your life than you invite him. God will never do more in your marriage than you ask God will never do more in your parenting than you invite him into. God will never do more in your finances than you invite him in to be Lord of your finances. Jesus is a perfect gentleman, and he'll never go further in your life than you invite him. But once the man asked, he took a risk, he took a step of faith. The blind man said, Rabboni, which means teacher, that I might receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight follow Jesus. The first thing that we see that helps blind people see is words of kindness. Jesus spoke kind words to an interruption and an irritation in his day. And it was his words of kindness that brought the healing that he needed to see. The power of words. The Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue. How many in this room sit here with a lifetime of hurt and pain and wounds because of a careless word somebody spoke over you. At the same time, we've all known the power of a healing word at the right time. The right word at the right time. That maybe in a moment of darkness, in a moment of depression, somebody came along and said words of life that drove away the clouds and brought out the sun. We all know what that's like. And in our life, we will encounter divine irritations and divine interruptions of people who need a word of healing. Will you be the one to give them that word? I was walking in Quick Trip one day, and I was walking to go get one of those 800 pound, 800 ounce soft drinks, you know, <laughs> like a buck 49, that's awesome. <laughs> And so I'm walking to get my, my soft drink, and I noticed out of the corner of my eye this young girl in her 20s who just looked like life had beat her up. I mean, she just, she was a wreck. 
She was like 20-something, but she looked like 40. Like she had just been beaten up by life. And, and as I caught that, I heard at the same time the voice of the Holy Spirit speak to me. Here's how you know the voice of God. When it's the voice telling you to do something good you don't want to do, that's probably God. <laughs> because we know it's not the devil telling you to do something good because he's not good. We know it's not you because you're selfish. Because we all are. So if it's irritating and it's inconvenient, but it's good, it's probably God. People go, I don't know how I hear the voice of God. There you go. You go. If it's irritating and inconvenient and it's good, it's probably God. So I heard. Eric, I want you to go up to her, tell her Jesus loves her. And that no matter what she's done, God's not mad at her. And God has a good plan for her life. I said, oh. So I literally turned the other way to go minister to the donuts. I think it's some really good donuts at Quick Trip. Let's just be honest. Ooh, sprinkles on there. Come on. You know where I'm going for lunch. So, so I go to the donuts. Praying about which one the Lord would have me partake <laughs> once. And I turn, and now she's standing by the donuts. I hear it again. Tell her Jesus loves her. God's not mad at her. And I got a plan for her life. I'm like, okay, God, I got the message. So I turned to her. I said, hey, I'm not a creep. <laughs> I'm not trying to pick up on you. But I felt God tell me to tell you that Jesus really, really loves you. And that no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been in your life, he's not mad at you. And he's got a plan for your life. Ah! 